So glad to be back with you. And we are in a series of people of the spirit. And I want you to turn with me to uh, Acts, the book of Acts, chapter eight. We're learning the birth of the church and how we you know, have this legacy of being people of the Holy Spirit, people who are led of the Holy Spirit, who, who are walking in obedience to God, uh, who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see uh, over the next, uh, the course of the next couple of weeks, some really powerful things that happen as people begin to invite the fullness of the Holy Spirit into their life. And that's what we're encouraging you to do, to be filled with the Spirit, not just to have these, these engagements and, you know, live a life as a Christian where I got my ticket to heaven punched and, you know, that's about all that's interesting to me. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I love God and that kind of thing. But to get engaged in mission, in the mission that Jesus has called you to and shaped you for, life is empty when we're not living inside mission that God has called us to live inside. Life is unfulfilling when we're not engaged in mission. You can have these wonderful moments like we had over this past weekend, and then soon they will go away and you're looking for the next experience. But if you're filled with the Spirit, you're constantly full with mission and, and drive and ambition for the things that God has called you to do and be. We're looking at uh, Acts chapter 8. Let's skip down to verse 26. We're going to read the story of where Philip encounters the eunuch. Chapter 8, verse 26. I think the passage might be up here as well. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and he went, and behold, a man, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, uh, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit of the Lord said to Philip, go near and overtake the chariot. And so Philip ran to him and heard him reading from the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before the shears, it, it is silent. He, uh, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation and his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch uh, answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and began, uh, beginning at the scripture, uh, preached Jesus to him. And now as he went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is uh, water. What hinders me from being baptized? And then Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And so he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and uh, he baptized them. And now he came up out of the water. The spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that uh, the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found in Astoas. Um, when passing through, he preached in the cities till he came to Caesarea. There is a huge difference for us between um, reading and understanding. Understanding is really very vital and important, and it's dangerous for us to not be able to understand. It's dangerous for us to not be under, able to understand uh, at work, uh, in our daily life. Certain things can be very dangerous if we don't understand them. High voltage, <laughs> hot stove. Um, they, then, you know, it, it is true of Scripture as well that it's, it's, there can be things that are dangerous for us not to understand. It's very important that we are people who understand and not just read. That we're not giving intellectual dissent only 
to the scriptures that we read, but that those, there, there is a connection to the heart that brings about obedience, that drives us to, to live out what God is calling us to do. And this was the case here. Jesus wanted his followers to be able to understand scripture and to be able to put them into action in their own lives and to be examples for him all around the world. And when Jesus uh, took leave of his disciples, he said to them that he was going to pray that God would send the Holy Spirit. And you, you, you might remember in John chapter 14, verses 25 and 26, uh, Jesus saying these words, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And so the disciples were dependent. They needed the Holy Spirit to remind them what Jesus had said to them on earth, but they needed the Holy Spirit as well to help them understand. You may remember the first week when we started this series that I talked about how uh, I appreciated my upbringing uh, in, in, uh, in, in faith, and, and we were taught to understand that not only do we go to God's Word and we, we do proper exegesis of Scripture, we try to find out simply what it really means. What did it mean to the original hearers? You and I don't use words like, they went out to sow. You know, we, we, unless we're talking about grandma who was sowing something. So we have no idea that that meant that they were planting seeds. And, and so going back and finding out what it meant to the original hearers is so important uh, to helping bring a little meaning to it, you know. And uh, we, we understand then what that passage could, could have meant to the original hearers as they're, as they're talking about spiritual principles. But then, you know, I was taught as well that we need a spirit exegesis, that we come to scriptures and when we open the Bible, that it is literally the Holy Spirit that's saying, let's talk. Sometimes we're like, oh, I don't know if I want to talk. <laughs> He's like, let's talk. <laughs> I don't know if I want to see that, read that, understand that, apply that to my life personally. And so it's important for us not only to come to the scriptures and do proper exegesis to find out what it meant to the original hearers, but to open ourselves to what the Holy Spirit would speak out of scriptures. The Bible tells us that the written word will, will lead only to the letter or the letter of the law is, is the language that's used will, will not bring life, but the spirit will bring life. It will help us understand. In the reading just the letter of the law, we get some intellectual background. We, we can look at the book as a historical uh, book and think through the things that it meant to the original hearers, but have no uh, application to our lives today and what's going on. And the Spirit wants to make it relevant for us today and help us to understand. And so the disciples needed the Holy Spirit to remind them of what Jesus was saying. They needed the Holy Spirit to breathe fresh life, bring understanding to them in their uh, time and in, their, in, in, in what was going on in their lives. And Jesus did this. Jesus practiced this spirited kind of hermeneutics. You might remember he quoted from Isaiah one time in the temple. And then when he finished reading from Isaiah, he said, you know, I've come to heal the broken hearted, to, to raise up the sick, to set the captive free. And when he finished that statement, this is the spirited hermeneutics. He said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. Today, you're witnessing the person who has come to set you free, to liberate you. Uh, to put into practice the things that you've been reading about for so long. And so the Holy Spirit uh, was a guide and, and empowered them toward mission and towards the things that, uh, that, that God wanted them to do. But understanding gives us the, the power to make a difference. You know, when I was um, on staff and ministry staff at Canyon Ridge Christian Church in Las Vegas, it was rapidly growing church a lot of things were happening and I was meeting a lot of interesting people and one of the gentlemen that I met we kind of became friends he was a regular who who kind of came by the the bookstore and the cafe places that I was a lot and uh, I would get a chance to encounter he was a a nuclear physicist so I know uh, what heavy water is. I had actually read it in a textbook and I have the definition for you up here. Heavy water is water that contains heavy hydrogen, also known as deuterium, in place of, of, of regular uh, hydrogen. It can, it can also be written as 2H2O or D2O. And uh, so I kind of like, I, I know this in my head, but my friend who's a nuclear physicist understands it. Right. And so he can create it. 
And, and that, that's the difference between just, just us having some head knowledge about something and having a, an idea about something and really understanding how to put that into practice. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit that wants us to be able to put into practice what we are reading and trying to get our minds around and understand. There's a huge difference between just reading and reading and understanding, right? And our Ethiopian friend had the scriptures, but he needed understanding. He had in his hands what you and I carry around in the sense of uh, not, not quite as elaborate as what we have today. But he had the Old Testament uh, scripture of Isaiah and he was reading through that, but he didn't have real understanding. And while those words kind of waxed eloquent and he, he, he had, had brought him to a place of, of uniting himself, becoming, you know, uh, converting to Judaism... They still didn't come alive in him to understanding, and he needed understanding. And he's, he's uh, what we would call, and we'll talk about this for a moment, an unlikely candidate for conversion. But I don't know if you know this or not, but the Holy Spirit is always after unlikely candidates for conversion. He's always out there trying to reach people that you and I would say, that's a very unlikely candidate for confusion, for conversion. And, and so that was the case here. And we'll talk about it. Arise and go forward to the south along the road, he, uh, Philip was told. It goes down to Jerusalem, to Gaza. This is the desert. And so he arose and beheld a man um, of Ethiopia, a eunuch, uh, one who had authority uh, under Candace the queen. A man of authority, a eunuch, an Ethiopian. And these three facts really are things that make him a rather unlikely candidate. First of all, an Ethiopian, because Ethiopia is in Africa and, and he had found his way to Jerusalem, he's 500 miles from home, right? So it's unlikely that somebody's going to be 500 miles from home that you're going to be ministering to, or in our day it's much more common, right? But in that day, that would have been a very uncommon thing, right? People did not travel like that. There were no planes, there were no trains, uh, no automobiles. And so to have someone around you who had come from that distance would have been really rare. And so here's a person who's come a great distance, first of all. So uh, that was a rarity. The second thing is it says, you know, he's, he's likely a born eunuch. And the reason that we would believe he's a born eunuch is uh, because of his conversion to Judaism. And it was uh, those who were made eunuchs were forbidden to go into the temple. Uh, Deuteronomy, I think, chapter 23 or 24, verse 1, uh, talks about that. They were forbidden to, to be a part of Judaism. And so uh, we think that he's probably a born eunuch. What does that mean? He was uh, sexually not developed. Um, so this, this was a person who also would have been, uh, from that perspective, a, um, a person that would have been, you know, uh, someone that would not have been commonly uh, gone after in terms of, uh, of a conversion. Holy Spirit is, is moving on Philip and saying, go after this person. I love him. I care about him. He's going to take the gospel back where he lives. And I also want him to know that whatever has happened to him in his life, I care about him. I love him. It's just such a powerful, powerful picture. And then it says, sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So out of the tens of thousands of Jews and Gentiles and Samaritans that need Christ, the Lord sovereignly has his favor on, on this man and sends an angel and then sends Philip. Um, and and uh, the Holy Spirit is guiding and directing him to go uh, right and connect with this man and speak to him. The verse, next verse says, rise and go toward the south uh, to the road that goes down to Jerusalem to Gaza. A picture of, of perfect timing by the Holy Spirit. Philip goes in obedience like Abraham went in obedience, not knowing where he was going to go. Philip is a lot like that. He just, the Lord just told him, go to this man. And he's like, this is weird. <laughs> I'm about to go to somebody and I have nothing to say, right? 
I, I, don't, I don't know where they're from. I have no connecting point. I like your sandals, you know, whatever. I don't know what I'm going to say. Your chariot is pretty cool. I like the stripe you have down the side of it. As he's probably thinking as he's, as he's hustling along to catch this guy, you know, catch up with this guy and, and have this encounter of things he could possibly say. And uh, he's trying to get this in his mind. But he's, what, what is cool is people of the Spirit just obey, right? Because they know that the next step will be given to them in a timely fashion. And so when, when he goes up, by, led by the Spirit, the supernatural guidance, he, he comes up just in time to hear the eunuch reading. Uh, verse 29 uh, says, he hears him read, and he goes up and joins the chariot. And, and he didn't know what, what he was going to say, but as he hears him reading, suddenly the Holy Spirit illuminates, okay, I recognize that. We have something in common. I can talk to him about what he's reading. And so Philip ran to him, and he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and he said to him, Do you understand what you're reading? Such so perfect timing by the Holy Spirit, and it gives Philip a chance to launch into explanation. But at that very moment, Philip had no doubt that this, this gentleman was wondering about what was going on and what, what he was reading. And it says in verse 31 there, And he said, How can I... Uh, understand unless someone guides me and he asked Philip and Philip comes up and uh, you you know we read the passage earlier that he was reading out of Isaiah led as a lamb to slaughter he's reading about the Messiah he's reading about Jesus the suffering servant and uh, so uh, uh, Philip begins to explain to him and begins to break this down he says uh, so the eunuch answered to Philip and said I ask you to whom is a prophet uh, say this is, is, is it of himself or is it someone else? And, and then the Bible says that Philip began to open the scriptures to him and began to talk to him about Jesus and he preached Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit spoke through the scriptures bringing understanding to the listener. And, and in this instance, he used Philip with an unlikely candidate for conversion. And now as they went down the road, uh, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see there's water here. What hinders me from being baptized? Man, this is a whole nother message for us. What hinders us from, from being baptized? What hinders us from deepening our, our roots? What hinders us from moving forward with God? And here's a man who, as the Holy Spirit brought understanding to him through Philip, using Philip to illuminate the scriptures, he says, uh, there, there's nothing really. In this statement, he's saying, there's, there's nothing that should hinder me. I understand and I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. I want to be baptized. That's enough understanding for this moment. I want to grow in this. I want to know more about what's going on. But for this moment, this is enough understanding for me. I'm ready to make the next move. And, and so they, they find this water and Philip baptizes him. And the question for all of us is there as well. What hinders us from making next steps? The eunuch's proclamation was, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What hinders us from sharing our hope? I'm going to invite the whole worship team in just a moment, but I'd, I'd, I'd like to um, just invite uh, Elizabeth on the keyboards for just a moment. The Holy Spirit wants to work through our lives in full capacity. We're the ones limiting him. We're the ones saying, you know, this is enough for now, and, and uh, I don't really want to, you know, I, I don't want to be a fanatic. I don't want to be totally weird. But we're missing out on being used for what we were designed for, what our purpose is. The Bible talks about often using, referencing earthen vessels to talking about us, earthen vessels. And it was, it's, it's interesting that... Um, as you go back and you look at original language of the day and what those things meant, there are several passages that talk about um, the treasure that is hidden in earthen vessels. I think it's in 1 Corinthians, talks about that. And when you go back to original language, you do your exegesis, what that means is that in their day, you know, houses weren't very secure, right? There were no windows, you know, um, uh, like we have windows today, no burglar alarms and and, uh, you know, so houses were relatively uh, unsecure. And when families left their homes and left treasures behind, they often would put those treasures, those things that are valuable to them, in an earthen vessel, something that was very common. 
Maybe it was broken. It was something that they would use every day, like to gather water or something like that. It was a good place to hide it. You use the freezer, right? How many of you are like, no, I won't ask you. <laughs> we hide our valuables, right? Today, and so those people in that day were hiding their valuables, but they were hiding them in an earthen vessel. And what the Corinthian passage was talking about was that somebody that doesn't have an eye for it would come in and, and look at those common earthen vessels, a, a robber, a thief, and would, that's the last thing they had any interest in. They're going through the cabinets looking for the china and the good stuff, and, and they're go, looking under the mattresses. They're looking for, you know, the, the money and the cash, the jewelry, and, some, and, 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 and they, all the time it had been hidden in a common earthen vessel. And that 1 Corinthians passage, the spirited hermeneutics of it is, God brings it to life for us and says, you are that earthen vessel, and Jesus is that treasure that I put down inside you. And other people may look at you and think, that's just a common person. They're, 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 they're just common, and, and uh, there's nothing special about them. There's nothing of extreme value of them. And they miss the fact that there's a tremendous treasure hidden inside you. But we do a disservice when we um, live like we are just that earthen vessel and we don't allow ourselves to be completely filled with the Holy Spirit and take on the authority of God as we walk into a place to be used by Him today. So your workplace, your, um, the place, the neighborhood you live in, where people have a need, where something's going on, and you hear somebody, a coworker say, I'm not feeling well, you know, I just, I'm just here today because I have to be here, that you can take authority in that moment and say, brother, I want to pray with you. I want to agree because I serve a God and I believe in a God who heals. I don't want to ask him to touch you and to heal you. I was walking by a, a cubicle several years ago and a, a young woman was in tears quietly. Other people had seen this. They had gone in and out for breaks and no one had addressed her. And so I stopped and I asked her and we had conversation. She said, I have an aunt that I love with all my heart and I lost her last night. She died. And uh, I said, you know, I care about that and Jesus cares about it and I want to pray with you. We joined hands right there and God began to fill up that little cubicle. You feel the presence of the Lord. And suddenly she knew that she was not alone, that I cared, that Jesus cares, that he loves her. Why are we walking around half empty? Why are we walking around in a sense of not being fulfilled? The Holy Spirit prepares, the Holy Spirit equips, the Holy Spirit empowers, and the Holy Spirit sends us to the world. Philip, man, this is a, a strange story when you go and examine it because I'm not even sure but what Philip, when he was told to go and engage the, the chariot, that the guy wasn't riding in the chariot, you know? And, and he may have run alongside it and stopped him. But there's some strange things in here. Philip baptizes this guy. When he comes up out of the water, Philip disappears and is in another place. Holy Spirit led. I'm not saying that you're gonna disappear and go somewhere else, you know? <laughs> That's God's sovereign work, whatever he wants to do. But I'm telling you, when you live as people of the Spirit, get ready. Get ready. Amazing things happen. Rest of the worship team, if you want to come and join, amazing things happen when we open ourselves to being filled with the Spirit. For those of you who are near my age, you might remember we were talking about this in our prayer circle this morning, Sanford and Son. And uh, I was curious for some reason last night, where is Lamont, you know? <laughs> Come to find out this guy was a pastor and he left acting to, to pursue the calling of God on his life. And I found a little video and it's a story of him. He's being interviewed and, uh, by a Christian uh, pastor and minister. And, and he's telling the story about when God had called him uh, to go and to do uh, a, a, a production in um, Trinidad about some stories that had taken place there where God had moved. And he took a, a, a team, a uh, camera team, various other people with him, and they went over there. And uh, when he got there, the, the ministry team that was heading the thing up gave him a cashier's check for $8,000 in the early 1980s. 
And so he has this money and he, he tries to get them moved into the hotel, but the hotel manager comes to him rather quickly after he's gotten into the room and says, you know, you got to give me some cash. You know, I mean, he, and he showed him the, the cashier's check and he says, that's no good to me. I can't do anything with that. He said, I'll give you one hour or you guys are out on the sidewalk, all of you. He said, we're not. And he said he went into his room. He thought, God, God you called me to come here and to do this. And he falls down on his knees by the bed. And uh, as he's, as he's kind of just feeling sorry for himself, he senses the Holy Spirit say, what are you doing? I sent you here. And he says, call the, the, uh, the Banco of de Trinidad or Banco of de Trinidad. He's like, I had no idea there was any Banco of de Trinidad. And he said, I thought I'm going to be a fool. But I called down to the, the front office and they said, oh, we'll give you the number for Banco de Trinidad. And they gave him the phone number, you know. So his courage is bolstered a little bit, you know. And then God gives him a name and he says, call and ask for this person. They're the vice president of the Banco Trinidad. And he says, um, I was so nervous and everything. And I thought I was going to come off looking like a fool. He said, I called and the person answers the phone. And I said, he said, I got mixed up. And I said, I want the president. And he, uh, I'd like to talk to the president of the bank. He gave the name. And the person says, oh, that's not the president. That's the vice president. I'll get them on the phone for you. And so the vice president uh, answers and he begins to tell his story and he goes, oh, that's, he says, it's great that you're here. He says, the bank is only open for 10 more minutes, but we will hold it open. You come down here and bring your check and I will give you cash. We'll take care of you. And so he came down, he received the cash. And he said, when I came back to the hotel, all of our luggage was sitting out on the sidewalk. And he said, I had to walk back in and go, do you guys take cash? <laughs> and... Uh, and, 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 and was able to take care of the situation. People of the Spirit, moving by the Spirit, flowing as God leads and directs, it's powerful, it's powerful. Our ushers uh, are going to be passing out the elements while we sing and invite you to, to rise and get ready. Hold on to those elements, that which represents the body of the Lord and the blood of the Lord. I'm gonna come back with you and we're gonna pray and receive communion together.